today we're going to be um, talking about uh, Irma and the Wildensteins, um, African Impressionism in post-war Europe. Now, there's quite a lot going on here, and um, there's going to be a, a, sort of a couple of tangents, so you'll forgive me, I'm, I'll try and stick to my notes um, as, uh, as much as possible, but um, I suppose there's, there's lots of different directions that we can, that we can go in, and the, and the, the, the paintings, um, I suppose one of the beauties of them, the, the paintings is that they are surrounded and swirl with narratives um, and, and, and di different, different biographies. Um, and uh, those, uh, those biographies, I suppose, are, are the real, the real storytellers. Um, so in this talk, what I want to do is two things. First is to um, place Irma Stern uh, at the very center of uh, the post-war European art world in the company of one of the most powerful and indeed infamous dynasties of art dealers in the 20th century, the Wildensteins. Against this biographical backdrop, my aim is to reframe our understanding of Stern not as she is traditionally read in terms of her German expressionist influences and origins, but instead as a harbinger of a moment that I would like to term African Impressionism. As I'll go on to illustrate the work uh, produced between 1939 and 1946, owes more of its influence to the works of the French post-impressionists that she encountered in 1937 on her last trip to Paris before the outbreak of World War II. And what's, what I've, I suppose, really enjoyed in this, in this process of research is, um, is the, the primary historical um, sources that we've got, and the primary historical sources being Stern's correspondence um, to her friends, the, the Feldmans, Rich and Frieda Feldman in Johannesburg. Um, and in that, you can, you can start to, to get a sense of where Irma was and, um, and what, her, you know, what her concerns were. Um, so in, in a letter um, to, to her friends, the Feldmans, um, in August of 1937, um, Stern, and this is quite telling, this is why I wanted to introduce it at the, at the beginning, um, places herself in the company of the greats um, and the great French post-impressionists um, writing confidently of her abilities, and I'm reading in Irma's words, at present, I feel, at present I feel I can do the same as the best here, and that is to say the best living, and strangely enough, uh, Gauguin, and mostly Van Gogh, seem to me like very much a level I have also reached. Not so, Cezanne. He has painted pictures so free and so unhampered by the world of the flesh. Here there is a picture in the onions in the, uh, um, of onions in the Louvre. I think it is one of the best pictures painted or on the highest level of art. I stood and I still, and I stood still and I still think of that picture only today. So this is Irma, as, um, and this is um, sort of, I suppose, contemporaneous with uh, the period 1937 of when she was writing, loosely give or take a couple of years. And I suppose this is, we can see the image of how she would have projected herself and presented herself to the public. Now, it's quite interesting, I suppose, that her, her in 1937, and it's her last trip to Europe, um, placing herself in the, in the company of the greats, um, because at the same time, and then this is, this is sort of new research that I, I managed to do, um, that she goes on to have her, her famous exhibition, Painters de Afrique in Paris in 1947, 10 years later, the Cezanne was being shown by the same gallery in New York um, at the beginning of the year. So, so it's, it, feels, it feels, I suppose, like on the one hand serendipity, but on the other hand, um, Irma's, I suppose, in, in, this, in, the, in the center of this, um, of this very, very big narrative that um, I think she still needs to be um, recontextualized and viewed in today with her contemporaries like, um, like uh, Cezanne. So this is just a, um, a, an interesting article I found in the New York Times. Um, and this was the first time that a quantity of Cezanne's had been taken to America. So I think he, um, it says that I think there were 86, um, uh, oh, uh, it's, it's a, New York is always um, uh, funny because of the street names, which um, are numbers, but um, it was the, probably the biggest Cezanne show ever held here. There were 68 oils. It was on um, 64th Street, but there were 68 oils and 17 watercolors um, at the time. And you'll see, so that was in the January of 1947 and in, in the um, August, October of 1947, Irma takes 117 pictures to Paris from the same gallery. So it's, it's just interesting to see the sort of the, the, 
the sort of contemporaneous nature of um, of what she was doing. This is the um, this is the the, the catalogue um, that was accompanying the Cezanne show um, at Gallery Wildenstein. And this was a this it's it's just interesting on a on a side note how these works um, uh, arrived in the U.S. So this was a this was a loan exhibition to benefit the New York inf um, to benefit the New York Infirmary. Um, and uh, remember, 1947 was immediately post-war, so um, it was it was interesting because I suppose it sets up the the sets up the scene to introduce who the Wildensteins were, and um, that's why this is. I, you know, I, re I was really very, very glad when I found this because it sort of it it starts to it starts to suit my thesis. Um, so, whilst um, Irma Stern's identification with these artists is important for the bearing of this talk, so there's the picture of the onions, by the way, just from the Cezanne. Um, the context of the letter is interesting. Um, writing from the Grand Hotel in Marinbat, a town in the historical home of Bohemia and in, uh, in present-day Czechoslovakia. She opens, I've come here from Paris to meet mother. Now, this is in writing in 1937. I've come here from Paris to meet mother, and she's not here, and I'm worried because she's in Germany. Now, the in um, impending specter of war that haunts her correspondence in this period is important because it signals a break from the Germany of her past and will go on to determine not only her movements, but more critically, the work that she would produce during the course of the next decade. A full 10 years later, Stern would return to post-war Paris with 115 um, works of art, um, including um, oil paintings and gouache, to mount what I propose as a career-defining exhibition titled Irma Stern Painters de Afrique at the Gallery de Beaux Arts, which was owned then by the Wildensteins. Now, who were the Wildensteins? During the Second World War, George, who was the son of Nathan Wildenstein, had fled, to, um, had fled to New York when the gallery was confiscated and supposedly looted by the Nazis. His father, Nathan, was an Alsatian-born Jew, in, um, uh, uh, born in 1951 in the gallery of Feigerschein. Um, and he also, in his life, had uh, um, fled to avoid conflict. In this instance, to France in 1870 to avoid the Franco-Prussian War when Alsace was annexed by the German Empire. It was here when he was working as a tailor in Paris, so the legend goes, let's just go down to, this is Nathan. Um, when he was working as a tailor in Paris, so the legend goes, that he began his art dealing when he served as the intermediary for a, a client who was selling paintings. After a period in the Louvre, educating himself um, uh, in art and looking at as much art as possible, so he found his heavenly disorder and the Wildenstein Empire laid its foundations. There's the... Is his first shop front. This was in Paris. This was um, he had partnered with um, Gimple and uh, uh, a friend of his, Gimple. When um, eventually he 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 went uh, he went solo. Um, and uh, this is a a, a young p a picture of his son George. So this was this, this sort of second in the in the generation. The the sons of George are Guy and Alex Alec, um, and they still are sort of infamous art dealers in the world and sort of famously dragged through the press recently um, with a, a tax bill of, I think, sort of something like 50 million euro that the French government has been trying to get out of them and they've been fighting for years. But that's another story. Um, that's, the, that's, the, that's this generation. Um, so, um, right, so the Wildenstein Empire laid its foundation. More accurately, as a struggling antique dealer, his eye was drawn to 18th century pictures which, which he began buying before, the, um, before they became fashionable. And that's also interesting because as we'll see, um, this is a consequence of the Industrial Revolution and, and I suppose a, a breakup of the, of the French countryside. So um, suddenly these 18th century pictures were available to the market when previously they had been sort of reserved for the aristocracy. And, that sort of aristocratic buying. So this was the, you know, it, it's quite interesting, the sort of the development of what objects become traded and what objects sort of become valuable. And that's why we'll, we'll get to Irma Stern and I suppose how the, the body of work that she mounts in Paris becomes so important in this sort of grand, in this grand history and grand trajectory of, um, of, 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 of art. So George had joined the company in 1910 after Nathan had opened um, their, new, their New York gallery almost a decade earlier at the turn of the century. He set about formalizing the system of research established by his father and overseeing the opening of the gallery in London in 1925. So they were quite prolific in their, in their, in their dealing. 
Um, partnering with an art dealer, Paul Rosenberg, um, George and, um, and Paul, under sort of the watchful eye of Nathan, um, once even had an exclusive contract to Pablo Picasso um, and uh, dealt extensively in Claude Monet. They were some of the pioneers of, um, of, of dealing and bringing the, the Impressionists to market. Um, whilst producing ambitious, ambitious catalogue raisonnés on Paul Gagan, amongst others. Um, so it's very interesting that, you know, Stern has already identified herself in, in, this, in this kind of company, you know, very confident in her own, own abilities. And, you know, the Wildensteins thus seemed like quite a natural fit in this, um, in this example. Um, interestingly, Nathan um, had sort of is described this whole time as looking on with sort of a, a jaundiced eye at um, the dealings of Rosenberg and uh, his son George because he sort of, you know, being an being a old master's dealer, um, he, he didn't, uh, you know, he sort of discouraged the, this kind of new trade. Um, and, uh, and so when he passed away in 1934, um, the, well, I suppose the wheels, the wheels start, start rolling with, uh, in, 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 in different directions. Um, the art world was in transition. Um, for centuries, the only people, as I mentioned earlier, who had bought and sold oil paintings of any quality were the aristocracy in Europe. There were marriages to arrange, mistresses to flatter, and chateaus and castles to fill with whimsical landscapes and frolicking nymphs. But by the end of the 19th century, the same aristocracy was at the tail end of a 200-year-long decline, ground by, down by um, industrial, industrial uh, revol and political revolution. Two years later, then in 1936, um, and does anybody, can anybody tell me who the, the man on the right is? It's rather, rather young Marcel, Marcel Duchamp. Um, so then two years later, in 1936, George would hand, hand over the Wildenstein Gallery to, to Marcel Duchamp um, and uh, they would mount a, a career, well, I suppose a, a, an era-defining exhibition called um, the... the International Exhibition of uh, Surrealism. So um, here, um, Duchamp was sort of the arbitrator, and this was, in many ways, um, this was seen to be the, the beginning of the end for, for the Surrealists. It's 19, um, the show eventually happened in 1937, two years before the outbreak of war, and it was, I suppose, filled with all of the, all of the kind of ennui of, of, a, of an impending war, um, and it was, it was trying to sort of flip the flip the modes of flip flip the modes of sort of traditional display and, and, and presentation, very much um, uh, very much in the spirit of um, of, of the, the, the you know the the Dada the, the later Dada movement. And interestingly enough, um, you can see in this this was um, <laughs> it's just it's it's quite funny. This this figure um, was the sort of an automatron, and, and it was uh, sort of the first. The first uh, sort of idea of a human Frankenstein or a, or a human robot. This was Andre Breton's um, sort of uh, costume, and he walked along like a you know sort of this sort of you know zom walking zombie. It was, um, and the, the exhibition itself um, was uh, more like a, a sort of a modern day installation than um, you know exceptionally um, avant garde for its time. Um, the the you can't really see in the slide, and the slides reproduced very badly because it was very dimly lit. And um, Duchamp had um, hung anthracite sacks from the from the ceiling, um, and went, which filled the filled the environment as people walked with this like musty, soot-covered um, smell. It was like quite noxious for the for the audience. And I think the outside there was a a broken down car um, uh, with a with kind of you know, this sex doll that um, uh, had been erected and there was, you know, uh, so it was, it was very avant-garde and, you know, audiences were left uh, pretty mystified at this, um, at this point. This is how the gallery sort of normally looked um, and this was a very sort of serious place. This was um, on, the, on the Rue Faubourg in, um, in, in, in Paris. Um, so th this, this sort of surrealist exhibition, it's just interesting to sort of, Place it in context. This was just pre-war, and um, was, was sort of how, how events were wrapped, ramping up. Um, and this was a de um, uh, kind of represented a, a decadence um, that Irma, I don't think, would have appreciated. And speaks to um, speaks in a way to how she was out of time with um, the avant-garde of European art during the interwar years. Instead, we find Stern 
as um, how I term her an anachronism, that is belonging to an earlier period with different concerns that retreat rather than advance into the grand scope of European modernity. So I think, you know, and, and that's always very interesting, I suppose, in, in, terms of, in terms of South African art history, we always seem to be, we've got, you know, a sort of a period of cultural lag um, where, where, you know, we are, and it's very interesting in this exhibition where, you know, work is, work is produced out of time with um, the way that it is in the rest of the world, or, you know, the, how events, how, how we constantly, I suppose, are revisiting and catching up to the rest of the world as the world has, you know, uh, you know moves on with, um, with other concerns. Um, so that is belonging to an early period with different concerns that um, she had uh, taken, so Stern, as I, as I go on to argue, had taken what she could from German expressionism, but with the advent of war, her sensibilities began to shift according to geopolitical forces beyond her control. Now, African impressionism is a tricky term, putting, and as I'll, as I'll say later, I mean, impressionism is technically not even correct, it would be more of sort of a post-impressionism, but putting African in front of anything is bound to raise eyebrows, especially when it's in front of a term with such a traditionally loaded European history. Furthermore, there's a question of heterogeneity. Africa is a big place, but be sure Irma saw a lot of it. Indeed, more than I have, and most certainly at a different time. I'd like to argue that this work from this period between 1939 and 1947, that I'm con for convenience sake calling her individual period of Af African Impressionism, is more in fact indebted to the post-impressionists that Irma placed herself in the company of at the introduction. Um, I must also um, preface at this stage that um, it wasn't to be sustained. Um, so this uh, 39, between 39 and 47, there's the, Stern is working, working in a particular mode. Um, and uh, as, as I suppose Europe um, opened up after 47 um, uh, and, her, and she started traveling back in Europe um, again, uh, the, the particularly um, starting with the Venice Biennale in 1948, her style again begins to shift. And I think she goes back to, she starts hearkening back to her early German Impressionist roots. So, I think this, uh, this particular period between 39 and 47 is, is quite tight, and that's what I'm terming, terming sort of African Impressionism. Here, in the preceding decade that begins in 37, where we started, we see a distinct shift in Stern's particular experience of modernism, one that is almost, again, out of time with the developments as they occur in Europe. Stern has very been, much been read as an Expressionist um, to date, and often with an often cited relationship to Max Pechstein and the avant-garde aesthetics of De Brucke informing much of her early work. But here, what I'm choosing to illustrate is a movement away from the influences evident in her work produced in Zululand, Swaziland, and Ponderland. So these were her earlier, her earlier travels that I suppose um, got the taste of um, that wanderlust, um, you know, internal, internal African or continental travel. Um, and where she very much, um, I suppose, was working in her, in her German Expressionist roots. Um, and then, as I argued, she moves on to a more intimate gaze that I feel um, lives up to Stern's own impressionism, um, impression of herself, written in the letter that she would manifest in the Congo and Zanzibar. Um, so, and these are, these are um, again, the, uh, the some, some clips of the of her travel of her travel logs. These travel logs are also very important because I suppose they provide another primary record of Stern's own experiences at the time. So she kept a diary um, and and a visual diary a, a lot of the time with sketches and um, and books. And um, I think Congo was published first, and then Zanzibar is a cumulative uh, is a cumulative um, book of her um, of her of her last um, of her of two trips. So. The impetus for this lecture, I suppose, where it began was, um, or where my interest in this period began was with these two pictures. And, um, and um, you know, we sold uh, Watusi Woman with Mountains um, on the right, and, um, and uh, Arab, or what is ter loosely termed Arab, or as I would um, prefer to have uh, had the title, Portrait of an Omani Nobleman, um, which was sold in um, May and October of 2019. So these were, these were sort of my, my entry points of, um, uh, into the research, and 
how the, you know, the, the, the paintings that sort of began this exploded view. And it's quite interesting because they bookend her, both her Congo and her um, Zanzibar excursion. So she returned twice to the Congo and twice to Zanzibar between 39 and 40, 46. And these two portraits effectively helped me define the golden age of Stern's wonderlust. So this, is, this middle period is what we call, what's loosely referred to as um, Stern's um, uh, golden, golden age. It's noteworthy to mention at this stage that um, these two similar paintings, um, there's two similar paintings that are held in the um, Rupen Museum's collection. So um, it's just, in, um, just to, for, for, for reference, um, I gave this, uh, this talk first at the Rupen Museum and so it was just quite interesting to, to see um, you know, how, how these sort of, why these works have been so, so collectible. Um, and also it gives us, um, uh, thus gives the presentation a certain immediacy that allows us to reflect on the lasting impact of Stern's production whilst examining the multiplicity of biographies and narratives that um, inform her work. Um, so it's this, it's this kind of subjectivity that, that began to interest me. It was, the, it was the relationship that she had with the subjects and the sitters that, that, that my sort of point of entry comes to. I wanted to know more about um, who, those, who these people were. Um, and for the figures represented in Stern's work, and more importantly, the virtually inaudible traces left by those that enter and exit her world, haunting the space around the canvas with the unspoken histories. And what struck me about these works is what, um, was how much historical texture was lurking in the space around these canvases. So I started with the portrait of the, as I termed him, the Omani nobleman, and I was kind of desperate in a way to, to affix an identity to, to this man. Now, this is dangerous, and I was <laughs> warned off it by, 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 um, by some, some friends, and they said, well, what is, what is your desire to sort of ascribe this fix fixity of identity? It's a kind of a, it's, it's a, it's a slippery slope because we start ascribing, we start ascribing um, fact to a picture that isn't there. We've got to make our sort of own assumptions. So, but, but nevertheless, I, um, so, so if you'll indulge me, this was, um, this was just a sort of the, 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 this was part, part of the journey that I took to sort of begin to understand what this, um, this picture was. So in, in Stern's writings um, of, the, of the, the Zanzibar manuscript or the Zanzibar travel log, she talks about going to the Sultan's palace. Um, and, and, she, and then in the letters with the, with the Feldmans, she talks about... Um, you know, the local, the, she sort of uses a colloquialism and she says, yeah, the local Hofmeyer here, local sort of, you know, the man in charge, the, you know, the guy with the plan kind of thing, um, has arranged for me to, to meet the Sultan. And indeed, she was given an audience, but um, not with the Sultan himself, but um, with his wife, um, who was affectionately, I think, called Nunu, as she, um, as, as Stern mentions in her text. And she says, but, um, but it was, it was wrong to, well, it was against the law or against tradition to paint the sultan while he was alive. So the, that privilege um, was only kept for, for the sultans when they were dead. So it was sort of, a, it was almost, a, in, is, in Islam, it's haram to paint, paint the sultan. But how did they even know who the sultan was? And I suppose the, the first point was the colors in a man's turban. So, and, and this is what I talk about when I talk about sort of historical texture that, that lies in these, um, in these pictures. So, it's, um, this is a, a, a picture of the Sultan of Zanzibar at the time, and I think you'd argue that there is a striking resemblance. Um, so, but, um, but, you know, there isn't, Stern doesn't write anywhere that she did paint the Sultan. Um, she doesn't, you know, she just makes sort of, a, an, she alludes to the possibility of doing so. Um, and as I said, so this is a sort of, this is a, an indulgence. But, so before, before any of this, before I had any of this information, the, the only thing that sort of presented itself to me was the colors in the sitter's turban. You'll see those colors come, um, come back um, a couple of times in, in other works that um, Stern's, Stern's done um, from the period. And that really interested me. And I thought, okay, well, surely that must be, um, you know, there must be, there must be something in that. There, there must mean something. And um, it, that sort of took me down the, and then you'll see another, another um, representation of the same colors. And then um, you'll see um, a, a member of the, 
of um, the, the, the Said dynasty. So, so I thought, okay, well, how to, how to decipher what, um, what, what these colors actually mean? And it goes back to the history of Zanzibar. So Zanzibar was um, actually owned by the no Omani nobility. Um, in, and I think it was in um, a split in 1870 um, when a sort of a cadet class of the, of the, of the Omani nobility sort of um, tried to establish their own sultanate. And there was a bit of a war between brothers and cousins. Um, and, and so the, the Said dynasty was in, established and ensconced on the island of Zanzibar, or then what was termed the Swahili coast. And it was a, it was a vital point because it was a, it was a strategic trade route. Um, and, but the, but the, the Said dynasty um, kept the, the, the homage to, to, and kept their attachments to the Omani um, nobility by wearing these, um, these colors in the turban. This is, um, the, not anybody can wear these um, colors. It's, it's, um, it's kept, it, it's, uh, it's restricted to, to, the, to the, Omani, the, the Omani nobility specifically. Then, so in the history of in the history of um, in the history of Zanzibar um, at uh, the time, and then the, this is also just another another fascinating another fascinating sort of occurrence that uh, that we can that we can place Stern in. So um, this was the this was the royal visit, um, and you'll notice the the Sultan the Sultan on the left with um, I think it was King George, was it King George, it is King George, um, uh, visiting, um, and I think this was just at the this was just at the um, advent of uh, the conclusion of um, the Second World War, so 1945, um, when, the, when that picture was painted. And Stern does, um, does a lovely uh, piece of text where she, talks about, um, where she talks about this visit. So we can almost play Stern in this audience. You know? uh, it's a wonderful, a wonderful um, I suppose, you know, uh, concurrency of history. Um, and, and really gives us a sort of a, 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 a picture as to the environment in which um, in which she was in which she, she was working. Then, so so that was so that was the sort of the, the, the context of the background to the to the Omani nobleman or, or Arab as it was loosely called. I, I found it increasingly problematic just to leave him with that title, but um, it's just the way of the world. Um, and so I was determined not to do that um, again with this picture. Um, I said, no, well, we have to, you know, if this is going to be a record somewhere, we have to find the correct title because it's, I suppose it's a, it's a, it's a notion of sort of historical correction um, and, and to do justice to, to do justice to these sitters. So, so um, I, we finally found this, um, this picture, well, I finally found this picture listed in this um, exhibition catalog of, um, of the 1947 show, um, Pentes de Afrique, and it was um, Watuti Woman with Mountain, um, or, or the French title that we'll see later. And going through the boxes um, of, uh, of, the, of the Irma Stern collection um, housed, at the no, housed at the National Library, I came across the, this negative. Of, um, and I sort of, and this large format negative, I sort of held it up to the light and I was like, wow, look at all those paintings. And, you know, it was um, sort of cut off on the side and I said, well, is it possible to get this scanned? We got it scanned. And what, um, what, a, what a journey, what a journey it uh, would become. So this was, um, this was the moment that we found, again, the, finally the, the, the correct title, um, Femme Watusi sur fond de Montan. Um, and uh, then, Again, I thought, okay, well, there's lots of clues in this, in this picture. There's lots of, again, surrounding historical texture about, you know, if not to place a sort of a fixity of identity, we can't tell who this woman was, but we can tell where it was, and we can tell, you know, what the situation was with, with Irma painting, and what was her psychological situation at the time, what was she going through. Irma's mum had died... Um, just just before this period, and Irma was um, she was, and she talks about um, going. I think it was 200 kilometers north of Elizabethville, um, which is um, present day um, Lumbambashi, um, to the Kivu, and she calls it the Kivu, um, uh, to to go and paint the Watusi, who she regarded as um, you know sort of 
African nobility that had um, uh, descended from the Egyptians and, you know, these very tall people and, like, you know, there was an incredible nobility. And so then, um, in, at the stage, then she writes about going to visit the lava fields and, and Lake Kivu is actually situated on the five, five Volcanoes National Park. And so I would argue that in this, in this painting, those are actually the mountains, are actually the five, vo five volcanoes of the Five Volcanoes National Park. It's got a new name now, in, which is in present-day Rwanda. And so that, again, I'm talking about like trying to fill in the, sort of the larger historical texture around these, uh, around these pictures, and we'll see, um, uh, we'll see how that, um, how that sort of, we can, we can expand it. Sorry, I'm going, I think I'm going quite, I'm just must check my, keep my time. As, as, as I said, there's lots of different there's lots of different avenues and junctions that we can we can run down with this um, with this talk. So this was then the and so I started going through and I wanted to attach um, a catalog to to that negative. So and then we I, I came across this exhibition um, this 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 catalog for the exhibition, which was at the Gallery de Beaux Arts, which was the Wildenstein Gallery, um, and uh, uh, shown in. Um, October to the um, 3rd of October to the 2nd of November 1947. It's very interesting at the same time because um, Irma and the, the, it was, this exhibition was actually set up with the aid of the South African and French governments and Irma again in her letters and this is, this I th thought was fascinating because I think she was sort of working and you know she got herself um, sort of caught up in a sort of a, 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 bureau a bureaucratic kind of exchange here. Um, well, diplomatic exchange. So, so it was set up by the government, and she said before she was handed a briefcase to take to the French government full of papers. She doesn't say what, and she kind of just makes this sort of, she utters the gesture that, you know, so maybe she was potentially moving state secrets around, or she was, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting sort of, I suppose, setup that, um, that this exhibition was actually um, conducted around. The French government bought the work um, from this. Um, from this exhibition, which was the Sultan's Palace. Um, and then works from here were then, I think, sent to Rotterdam and then to London afterwards. We've got the London catalog that we'll go through um, in, in a bit. So this is just the, this is just the introduction in French um, and sort of it's, it's um, I don't have the translation on me, but um, it sort of, it just speaks about, um, you know, this, this wondrous, uh, this wondrous, white woman who's been traveling in Africa and has brings back all, has brought back all of these kinds of exotic views. Um, and then again, I wanted to then, sorry, this picture's, um, uh, this picture's a little bit blown out, but I wanted to then just show some of the pictures of the landscape and then kind of compare those to some of her gouaches to again, place Irma within, within that environment and in, in that landscape. So this is the, this is, um, North of the Kivu, in the five, in the region of the five mountains, um, uh, volcano, five volcanoes national park, and I think you'd argue you can get that sort of the the, the sense of of um, of Stern's um, of Stern's relationship to that landscape, and and this is where I'm this is where I make um, my argument for not an expressionist take on in relationship with the landscape, but rather an, um, one of the sort of the post impressionists, and this is Stern. So now you start to see the Irma of 1937, who's ranking herself up there with uh, Gagan and Van Gogh, not quite Cézanne, who she idolizes. Um, and thus she starts producing these kinds of works. This is Congo landscape. This is in the collection, I think, of the Irma Stern Trust. Again, I just wanted to include some of these sort of, again, you can see sort of the mountains and um, the, the sort of lush, verdant landscape. And painted in 1946 on her last visit. Um, so, and this is actually on Lake Kivu. She was staying in a guest house on the shores of Lake Kivu, and she got malaria at the time. Um, and she had these incredibly bad dreams. And uh, as I've sort of said elsewhere, um, it was a sort of she was filled with this ennui because of the loss of her mother. And she had apparently she writes in her in, in her letters that she would dream of her mom during this period while she was um, sort of staying at this guest house. So quite a, you know it's these pictures are also full of. I suppose a particular sort of emotional turmoil for Irma at the time. It wasn't an easy time, time for her. Um, again, another shot of Kivu, and then these gorgeous squashes that she does of, of, 
of water. I mean, she's really got a, she's got a, a fascinating relationship with water. She manages to ca capture sort of the reflective qualities um, of, of water, particularly in her gouaches. I'm um, interesting, I was reading just a, a, a kind of one of the telltale signs, which is not evident um, immediately in this picture, but uh, in her gouaches, um, you know, she would, after, after uh, you know, her, her, her early visits um, where she hooks up with the German Impressionist, she would, she would come to term herself the blue one. Um, and, you know, sort of, which was this, like, you know, ennui-filled character. And, um, and in, in many of her gouache and in many of her paintings, she does blue underpainting. Um, and so you can always see these sort of the, these, these, these sort of lines of either cobalt or ultramarine in the, you know, just as, as she would sketch out the, 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 the borders of her compositions. So, um, but then, uh, and then the, this particular series um, of, of portraits really, really fascinated me. And I think, um, and, and, you know, it's this, there's a kind of, there's a tension, there's a tension that, that she manages to fill, uh, fill her characters with um, that, you know, I've, I've sort of perhaps ambitiously said that there's a beginning of what we see as a sort of a post-colonial subjectivity. I mean, very, Stern was very much, you know, a product of her time in a colonial period, but I think the kind of attention and the fidelity that she gives to her subjects, the ob observed fidelity that she gives to her subjects, takes takes them out of um, of of a tendency to 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 regard these paintings as being overtly exoticizing the other um, in in terms of a in terms of a, a subject. You know, here there's far I feel a far deeper subject relationship um, and a, and a, a relationship between sitter and sitter and artist. Um, so, and and what's quite interesting is that um, we've got. Photograph. So, so this was an encounter um, with, um, with again, the sort of the, the you know, and the, the Watusi nobility. And it's important to note, to note that Stern considered herself, considered herself quite a high roller in many, um, uh, in many respects. She, she would like to move with the aristocracy. She would like to move with well-heeled people in her environment. She was quite a, she was a snob. She was a bit of a socialite at the same time. So it's automatically... In Zanzibar, she's um, she's attracted to sort of the the, the class of people around the Sultanate, um, and you know the, the sort of wealthy Arabs, um, and uh, as well as 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 painting sort of some of the some of the poorer people in, in Zanzibar at the same time. But same thing in in that happens in Congo, um, and uh, she she's attracted to to the chiefs, to the the you know the the the, the class of nobility. Um, and so she, um, this is two early pictures of um, Rosalie Jakanda and um, Emma Bash Baki Shingari. Um, I don't pronounce that right, but so this was, um, this was, Rosalie Jakanda was termed the last queen of the Watusis, and then I think um, uh, Prince um, Emma was a, was a princess. And you can see, again, in the, the kind of, you know, the very accurate, um, a depiction that uh, that Stern that Stern um, uh, gives of this of, of Princess Emma, um, and and it's just interesting. Is that and then this is a this is a sort of a contemporaneous um, portrait of uh, of Rosalie Jacanda. And Rosalie Jacanda, I think, is um, is an important is an important sort of again um, with uh, sort of historical texture. Um, ar around sort of Stern's encounter. Um, so, so the reason, um, it's, it's, perhaps I didn't spell it out earlier, the reason that um, Stern was traveling in, in Africa was that she was afraid to travel in, well, she was, she was unable to travel in, 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 in Europe because of, um, during the interwar years, because, um, you know, Europe was in strife and um, Jewish people were being persecuted whilst very, whilst very secular, Irma was still Jewish and, um, you know, was appalled by what was happening um, uh, to, to, to her people in Europe. And so it's just, I, th I, find, this, I find this coincidence kind of remarkable. So, so whilst, whilst avoiding persecution, um, Stern comes across Rosalie Jacanda, who was, and then the significance of Rosalie Jacanda thus becomes, um, comes into stark, um, uh, stark, stark view, 
Um, she comes across Rosalie Jacanda, and Rosalie Jacanda was one of the first people killed in the Rwandan genocide in 1994. So, so Stern, a Jewish woman, avoiding the persecution of her people, comes across a Watusi woman who would be persecuted some 50 years later after this meeting for, for her own ethnicity. So it's, again, you know, I think this, the kind of the, this historical, this historical intersection is, uh, is worth noting. And again, fills up these voices that sort of loom around, around the works. These are just some of the um, uh, pictures of, um, the, in Stern's area, she would have come across uh, Mutara III. And you can see some of these portrait of Rosalie Jacanda on the right and um, uh, Mutara, Mutara III in the middle. Um, and again, so this is, I suppose, you know, Stern wasn't, wasn't out necessarily painting, painting the exotic. I suppose she was painting and, and representing histories of, histories of, of class relationships and, um, and, and, and um, histories of, 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 you know, or pictures of, of society as it was at the time. Um, obviously, it does become slightly problematic, and I suppose, and as I said, um, very, much, uh, very much Stern was a, was a product of the time. So what, you know, what, the, what, the, what, the, Belgian, what the Belgian colonists had done was um, to also, I suppose, exotic, exoticize, exoticize the sort of habits and, um, the habits and culture of, uh, of, of, of the people in the, in the Congo. And um, so and they, had taken out, um, they had taken out sort of all the, you, you know, with the, with, the, with the firm hand of uh, Christianity, they had taken out sort of um, any kind of ritualistic practice. So this was just merely, um, you know, the, and, um, and they had sanitized it to the point that, um, you know, there was these cultural villages that um, were set up for tourists to go and visit and, you know, then to, to see, you know, I suppose, like, we would all be very familiar with in South Africa, um, you know, as a, as a legacy of apartheid, where, you know, you would go to, you know, a traditional Zulu village, and, you know, you'd have a guide walk around, and, you know, so, but, but this was sort of stripped and controlled by the Belgians to, to, to work, and you can see that, you know, that the sort of desired effect that Stern is kind of reaching for, so I think it's, you know, it is a little bit of a push and pull when we talk about, you know, these, these you know, quite authentic relationships that she seems to have with sisters and then this, you know, sort of this, this tendency to, to, to bask in that um, sort of auto exoticization of those subjects at the same time. Um, these are just um, some pictures, but again, as I said, um, you know, I find there's a striking fidelity to Stern's, to Stern's representation. She's not making anything up, you know, and um, a, lot of the, a lot of the time, um, you know, there's this tendency to say, oh no, you know, Stern, she's just putting a flower in the hair, or uh, et cetera. I think it, you know it goes deeper. I think she was uh, she was deeply observant. Um, so so it was um, it's yeah it's just um, it, it bore no sync. Um, before the 1947 exhibition, she she had um, she had a couple of previews um, of these works, um, and this was um, one of those previews um, at the Argus Gallery. Um, and it's very interesting in the catalogues to these exhibitions, and you can see what a big deal um, Irma was treating the the, the Paris show um, as because. Um, she, uh, she, she writes in the, in the catalogue, um, uh, worth not for sale, this is reserved for my Paris show. Um, and, and, the, and this is where I sort of first, first thought, okay, well, this is, this is quite interesting. What do, what do these kinds of photographs um, enable us to do? And so we went on a bit of a historical recreation here to, to, look, for, to look for works that were, that were shown, and these were... These were um, the works that uh, that would would travel to Paris later, and we can see. Uh, and yes, and this is um, I'm glad I illustrated this. So this is the um, you can see the the works not for sale would be the works that were um, reserved for reserved for her Paris show. Um, this is a portrait um, of a, a man named Abbe Brule, um, and why I included it was he was um, I think he was a, a German. Um, Ethnographer and um, one of the one of the um, sort of uh, proponents for for Irma to to exhibit in in, in post-war Paris, um, there was at the time, as we said, it was organised by the French and um, a, a, a joint affair with the, between the French and South African governments. But there was a cultural embargo on at the time. You couldn't actually sell art. It was um, 
because, because of as the Europe was um, sort of in a, in a plans of um, reconstruction and you know the, there was all sorts of funny business with the Nazis and, and looted art. So, so there was this um, full on cultural embargo which um, Stern somehow kind of avoided. Um, and, and you know these show this, this Painters de Afrique and then the um, uh, Brows and de Blanco show that we'll talk about later was also when the, she took that show to London and she also traded um, in, in London. So it's quite interesting to, 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 to note how she would have sort of got around that, um, around that embargo. So as I mentioned, I found two negatives in the, in the boxes that were, were developed. And again, I just wanted to, so this was the, this was the other side of um, the Wildenstein Gallery. Um, and I just wanted to show you some of the very serious works that were that were included. Um, again, you can see works that were some some works at the Ar uh, at the at the Argus Gallery. Um, Banana Carrier, I think, is in the collection of the Rupert. The again, you can't really see, um, but the, the Omani colours come in in um, I think it's called Rich Old Arab, um, which is in the the collection. I don't like these titles, um, but that's in the collection of the Stern Museum. Um, there we go. It's a, um, and then this is from 1945. Um, as I mentioned, um, you know, different spectrums of, uh, of, the Swahili, of the class structure that would have made up um, the Swahili coast on our left. Um, this, I think, recently sold in Bonham. Um, and uh, you can see sort of Stone Town in the back. Um, we've also, um, the Strassenko was lucky enough to um, handle the, uh, this um, still life on the right, and again, the, the detail of the banana carrier, um, and uh, Congo group, and another still life, and the Mauve Sari. Um, it was, uh, um, this came out of, um, I think, uh, uh, also um, handled in the same sale as the, as the Arab or uh, portrait of an Omani nobleman. So it's also just um, a side note, it's important. Um, I think we had, we had three very major um, uh, portraits from this period in the, in the sale that we sold the, the Omani nobleman, which was to date, I think the second highest price paid at the South African auction for Ernest Stern. It sold for 21 million Rand, whereas the highest is two Arabs that had fetched 22 million Rand in South Africa. So just to, to give you an illustration of the kind of desirability um, of, of these pictures. This is just an alternative view. And, um, and you can see our Watusi woman with mountains um, in the side. I mean, you know, it was really, when I looked up at the negative, I didn't think that there would be, you know, a possibility that we would find her, but um, she's in the, in, the, in the side here. And just to go through. Also, again, I think this is in the collection of the Norval Foundation, um, the Arab priest. Um, and... Um, and uh, this, uh, the red headscarf is, um, I think, uh, written about in, in Sean O'Toole's new text. Here we've got, and this is, this is also, again, um, you know, just an example. This is a flower in the ear. <laughs> um, but uh, this is the, um, in the Rupert collection of a Mangabutu woman um, and uh, a Watusi woman. So the Mangabutus are, you know, formerly, or are now um, the, the Hutus and the, the Tutsis were the Watusi. Um, and so, you know, again, Stern is, you know, bringing, bringing up and, and making evidence um, these, uh, these relationships and, and on com comparison very, very early on. Um, this is, uh, uh, this is, it has been remarked that this is, a, I think, a, a child, um, uh, a child and, um, but I think it might be a child bride. Um, it's a, a rather unpopular, um, rather unpopular reading, but. Um, and then the works go um, finally to to um, Browse and Darby. Well, it was at the time it was um, Browse, Darby, and De Blanco, and this was operated. And so again, just I wanted to fill in um, historical the the hi historical texture that 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 surrounds surrounds these works, and um, and then finally. We're going to just um, talk about um, some provenance of, uh, of, uh, of uh, our, our Watsusi woman with mountains as a, as a way of um, sort of, I suppose, wrapping up. So the works go to, um, the works go then to London, to um, 
uh, Cork Street to um, run by run by uh, Lillian Browse, who was um, the apparently the uh, affectionately termed the the self-appointed Duchess of Cork Street, um, uh, and and this is a sort of and so this is just a I thought it would just be interesting to to sort of contrast the British and the French um, dealers. Um, if you like, uh, of, the, of the period. So you can see sprouts in the, in the background. And then this was the cataloging. Um, and this is where I got the English, uh, the, the English translation from Watusi Women with Mountains. But there's a singular, but um, you know, we, could, we managed to manage with some certain, certain, certain conviction that it was uh, the same painting because it's got the, the catalog number uh, corresponds to the, to, the, to the catalog number of the of the Paris show, um, and then just um, in 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 sort of in wrapping up, it's um, interesting again to to note the sort of as I said the, the the voices that that start to intersect and and we we started I started going a little bit further into into looking for the provenance um, of uh, of the Watusi woman with mountains and it's a, it it led to such an unexpected such an unexpected um, uh, sort of end that I suppose um, <laughs> is is it's a, it's really it's a it's a it's a side note um, but and more of more curiosity but just um, it shows us you know the the remarkable the remarkable texture as I, as I said earlier so we started I, I found the I found the work illustrated in 1974 um, from a Sotheby's Park Bonnet sale and um, it was and and this was fantastic because. Um, uh, you know, um, it 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 gave us it gave us sort of a, a thread to follow. But um, I was more interested again in the in the notes, the property of Dr. R. L. Worrell, and I just thought, okay, well, who who was this man, and um, you know what was you know what was the relationship? Why who was he, and why was he buying Irma Stern? Um, you know, and uh, he must have bought the Watusi woman with mountains from the. Um, Browse and Blanco show because it hadn't been seen and hadn't been exhibited after that. So it had sort of gone out of the circulation and gone into the UK. And so I thought, okay, well, this is, um, you know, this, this man is interesting. Let's try and see what we, what we can find out about him. And so then Albert Einstein <laughs> and Sigmund Freud pop up into the equation. So um, Dr. R. L. Worrell was a philosopher um, and, um, you know, quite a, quite a, a noted a noted um, thinker at the time, and um, he had corresponded famously with Einstein and uh, and and Freud, which um, and the letters um, of those correspondents were actually sold at Christie's recently, um, and and these are the these are the two letters, and so you'll see this is a a letter on a on an Albert Einstein letterhead, um, written in German to Dr. R. L. Worrell, and um, uh, Professor Dr. Freud. Um, Again, written to, written to 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 Mr. to Mr. Doctor or to Dr. R. L. Worrell. So, so I just thought it was it was a what an amazing what an amazing sort of um, again sort of historical coincidence that uh, that that we find ourselves in. So, thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> Sorry, there was, as I said, there was a lot. There was a lot in, and you know, we, we could, I could dash down, dash down different avenues um, uh, all the time. But um, you know, I think this is the, you know, just this this period, um, this period of work. Every painting, I suppose, is presents um, presents a different story that can be told. So uh, this was just a the Wildenstein. The Wildensteins were more of a of a conceit to to get into the. To get into this, uh, to get to understand and frame this this period, the Wildensteins, interestingly enough, though, um, have um, you can read all about uh, all about their most um, their most their most recent the family's most recent exploits. So after George, there was Alec and Guy, who 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 look after it now. And as I said, there's um, you know during the during the late 40s, um, there was um, contro controversy that still haunts them today because. Um, as um, the fact that they were Jewish it didn't stop them necessarily trading in um, in, in in looted Nazi art. So 
what happened was they, um, they, they again, and that specter of war again, so Nathan flees Alsace, George flees Paris for New York. You know, there's this constant, there's this constant threat of war that's chasing, that's chasing these, um, these people to, um, and, um, from, from persecution, you know, to flee from persecution. So what happened was that they left then a custodian in charge, like an Aryan custodian in charge of the, of the gallery as the, and, um, you know, what happened was galleries were, the, the Germans would, would confiscate galleries and they would, call, they would Aryanize them, you know, sort of um, free them of any delinquent, what was termed delinquent art, um, you know, of which the surrealists really, you know, <laughs> express the epitome of that. Um, and, and so they, when they came back, um, and there, there was this, the, the one of the most notorious um, affairs was the Khan affair, Alphonse Khan, um, and um, which uh, was said, to, and he was, um, he used to own these illuminated manuscripts, and uh, which were, f which was sold then later by the, the, the Wildensteins, and um, upon examination, they found a, a red sort of chalk pencil in the in the corners of the McKay, and that's how the Germans used to mark their, their, their stolen work. So this has been always, you know, a huge slight for the Wildensteins that they were, that they were sort of collaborating with the Germans at the same time from, from New York, because they were, you know, managed to, when they got the gallery back, they, you know, they still, they kept their stock. So, so it's, um, you know, the Wildensteins are kind of shrouded in this, in this sort of, yeah, quite murky haze, um, which is, uh, yeah, which is another whole story. So it's interesting. Out of so, if you look at the you look at the consignment notes. So there's um, 117 works go for the Paris show, and then I think about 27 works make it to London, and then there was a show I think in Rotterdam because then she was going to exhibit in in Holland, and I think um, a bunch of works go they split up. So, I mean, I think about 30 works, I don't know, I haven't seen those catalogues, the ones that went to Rotterdam. So, I mean, there's all sorts of, you know, there's all sorts of holes in the, in the research as well that I, you know, because the catalogues, as I said, are the primary, the primary historical data we can glean from the things. And that's how, you know, we can at least try to trace, you know, correct titles of things, because the correct titles of the paintings then allow us to make all sorts of other kinds of observations ar about the picture, but with an incorrect title, you know, the first, that's the first sort of stumping ground. Yeah. Who no, I, I, yeah, I'm sure somebody does, but uh, <laughs> I wouldn't, but I mean, I think, you know, and what's, what, what I've proposed is, you know, for, 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 for further research, research to be done, there needs to be like almost a forensic process of what paintings went where. And Stern did, you know, famously in her, in her book, you know, she, she, in her ledger, she records, uh, you know, I've got, um, you know, and the Feldmans used to send her like a monthly check of 20 pounds, you know, and then I think in 58, you know, if you look at the correspondence from 58, she says, no, stop now, I think you've paid that painting back, and, you know, and she talks about borrowing pictures from, from them, I think she, they had the Watusi, the Watusi Queen in, 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 in red. So, so, but there needs to be, you know, I think it's, you know, it's necessary because, you know, some of those, some of those paintings show in the Argus Gallery, then in the Wildenstein Gallery, and then in London, and then like the Watusi Woman of Mountains, then they go cold. Um, and, you know, and, and then they pop up again in 1974. So, you know, the, it's, it's quite, quite amazing. And they, they disappear from circulation for 30 years, um, which is, you know, which is part, part of the course. Mm. Precisely. So that's what I, I think. I'm glad. I'm glad this was asked. I mean, as I said, probably technically would have been more correct if I called it post-impressionism. Um, but um, I suppose it was, you know, and and it starts. So the 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 it starts in in 37, um, how, and when Stern identifies, you know, so she was she was going to all of these exhibitions, and she identifies herself 
in the sort of in the, the artistic kindred spirit of of the po of the great post impressionists you know so so i think it was and that kind of break from her german influence because so so you must also understand it as like a a, a circumstance like a geopolitical circumstance so you know um, germany is on the brink of war or europe's on the brink of war 37 you know and it's um and the the arms race is is mounting up and there's all this sort of anxiety and stern you know she was um very much very much a, a an expressionist baby you know in that in that in that working in that vein she was you know a kindred spirit of the expressionists of pechstein and um and you know and, and particularly de brucker um, not so much de blower writer um but then that 37 show i think she, you know and she and you read the correspondence and she gets totally caught up in paris she falls in love with paris um and you know really sees herself fancies herself as that as that kind of artist and starts painting thus in that kind of vein um and and as i said it's only it's, that's why she's a sort of anachronism so, so she's sort of she she's caught in another time she's looking precisely as she said 50 years backwards um rather than responding to to the trends as they were in in europe at the time you know and europe post-war was um you know, more interested in, in abstraction, um, you know, and more interested in, in pushing the limits of the perceptual field, whereas Stern was, you know, her, her response to that, to try and catch up, is to, is to start painting thinner, and she, she starts looking more like a looser, a looser version of herself in the, in the 20s and 30s, I think, um, you know, sort of post-1950. Um, so, th but this, you know, and I think it's, and I think it's partially, a result of a result of this sort of spirit of travel and also you know the kind of the orientalism um that that was evident in in many of the post-impressionist sort of worldview and i think she finds that serendipitously enough finds that kind of orientalist influence um that's seen in her mark making in zanzibar um you know and so i think it was just kind of all of these geographic conditions that like emerge to to uh, you know and then we as I said, we, we see her, I think, more in, in light of, um, you know, a mix between, uh, you know, even of the fluidity of the paint, like a, 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 a mix of um, Cezanne, well, Van Gogh and, and Gauguin with, you know, and then in her, in her particularly in her still lives, you see her trying to sort of imitate, imitate Cezanne a little bit, um, you know, particularly in her, particularly in her fruit, um, you know, and you see the sort of those, that orange mark, she tries to use some of his palette as well. But, um, you know, he was, uh, I mean, he was sort of, yeah, he was, Cezanne for me was better with, um, with, with flat surfaces. Um, you know, he was, yeah, he had a different kind of control. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I included actually at the, at the beginning of the, at the beginning of the, um, of the, the, the Cezanne onions, because she writes about it, um, and she writes in 37 that she says, this is the picture that she can't stop looking at. Um, and, um, you know, this is what, what she was drawn to. Where I said, where I said that um, Cezanne was better with flat space. I mean, if you just look at the profile, look at the profile on the table and like these soft, soft blues that he manages to incorporate in, you know, in, these, in these surfaces, it's, um, you know, and it's, uh, and it's funny, Irma didn't, didn't favor this, um, the, the landscape. She always propped her, well, not always, but um, she propped her still lives the other way. She always would attack the, you know, compositionally she would attack a portrait, whereas Cezanne, you know, was, um, was sort of safer, felt safer um, in, in a landscape composition. So, yeah. But it's, yeah, you can really see those onions. It's really, yeah, it's a good picture. Actually.